Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of Bearski Film. Uh, this week we're joined by a very special guest, Nick, from Just Another Year Chicago Sports. Uh, Nick's got an awesome YouTube channel where they cover, you know, all Chicago sports, Bears, Bulls, everything. And uh, I got the honor of meeting him a couple weeks ago at Rizzo Sports Bar for an event that he threw. And uh, through, very knowledgeable, good, consistent content. Nick, I don't know if you want to say yeah, nice to meet you guys. Uh, or not meet you guys. Uh, we've obviously met already, Paul. But uh, Dave, nice to meet you, and thanks for having me on the show. Uh, obviously, a very tough loss yesterday. Um, don't don't even think. I don't understand how Matt Eberflus still has a job, but here we are. So happy to be here. I'm sure we're going to talk about it today. Definitely, we've been talking about it, and it's we've kind of gotten to a point where it's like, all right, let's stop kicking this dead horse. But I mean, we go a year back and find videos, especially after the Broncos collapse where we were like, should we fire this guy mid season? And, you know, it's just unfortunate that we've had to let it get to this point for, you know, the majority of people to realize that this isn't not, this is not only not good enough, it's terrible. <laughs> so um, yeah, Dave, what are your, uh, I'm gonna let you have at it. Cause I know you, you got plenty to say. I'm sure. I mean, I just have lots of ideas. I'm, I actually am much less uh, talkative about this loss than I was last week. Cause I think last week was a little bit of that writing on the wall stuff that we have been talking about. And like, Nick, I don't know about you. I'm sure you, you with the channel, when we get things right, we have to kind of toot our own horn just to kind of be consistent about, you know, tooting our own horn and stuff. And we, we've been on the flus train for a while. Um, so none of this was like surprising, but it just was really, really, it made us very angry because it was all avoidable. And I think the writing was on the wall a long time ago for people like me and Polly who predict nine and eight seasons and, you know, are a little bit more realistic about this kind of stuff. And um, <clears throat> Polly and I have, we have literally for 10 years discussed our football philosophy and like cultivated it to what we expect and what we want out of like the bears for the future. And at this point, I think we have both hit the point where, it's championship or bust. And if you're not doing things to move towards that, then you're wasting time. And uh, this is why this year, and I said, we said this week three, I, I feel like we're just regurgitating week three. And then uh, Jacksonville and Carolina kind of fooled us. And we, we've we admitted that we got fooled really, really hard and it sucks. But this is just us rewinding to week three when the team was what it was. And um and yeah, like you can't win with this. It's just your ceiling is so low. And uh, yeah, you're not you're not doing things like a serious organization towards championship contention. This is just this is just more of the same. Just another year. Right. Like the, like your channel <laughs> says. But um, it sucks. But it is what it is. And uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm less emotional, but I'm much more. I don't know. I'm angry to the core on this one rather than being reactionary angry. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I the problem is is that we the last four years is all or the last four coaches have all been kind of experimental, right? I mean, John Fox was coming off of you know he was good in Carolina and Denver was like, eh, you know, you're you're okay, like you know you got the job done, you had good players. And then you come to Chicago, he's the only veteran head coach that we brought in since Lovey Smith. Everyone else has been a rookie. Mark Tressman, Canadian Football League, Matt Nagy, rookie coach. And then you bring in Eberflus, rookie coach as well. Some guys are just meant to be coordinators in this league, and I will pound the table for that, that Eberflus is that guy. Kind of like Vic Fangio when he went to Denver after Chicago, just didn't work out. It's just a frustrating standpoint because of the fact that Flus made a great defense, and you can see that they gave up on him. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit. But no offensive progression over three years. You've had two very good quarterbacks. And people are like, oh, Justin Fields wasn't good. Look what he does over in Pittsburgh. You know, you give him a good head coach, he's winning ball games. Was he winning them pretty? No, he wasn't throwing for 300 yards, but he was getting the job done. He was doing everything that we needed. If Caleb Williams was just as fast as Justin Fields with also his scrambling ability, he would have gotten away from a lot more stuff yesterday. But this Bears team is just too good from a roster standpoint on paper to be this bad and losing games the way they're losing. Because the four wins this year have been great. I think we can all agree on that is, you know, four wins is to win more than last year. You're halfway to the win more wins than you had last year. But overall, the team, it's just frustrating to watch because drops by Keenan Allen were unacceptable. No targets to Cole Komet. There's just not communication 
amongst the coaches. And I actually was talking to a former bear that's still in the NFL right now today. I was uh, texting him, you know, kind of, what are you feeling from the coaching staff? What are you feeling from, you know, what was it like when you were at the bears? He goes, all I'm going to say is it's a top down effort and the effort from the top, especially the criticism that he gives to his coordinators is not there. So kind of Eberflus players are pointing that Eberflus is the problem. And that's where I now I'm no longer on the Eberflus train. I, uh, before halftime, when they interviewed him real quick, or right after half, coming out of the half, and they're like, you know, would you tell the team? He's like, I told them what the score was. I told them we had each other. I just had a flashback to super bad where McLovin's in the hallway, and he's like, I told her what time it was. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is what it's we so have. I, I've watched like halftime schematic uh, type of interviews where Kevin O'Connell or Zach Taylor would be coming off the field and be like, yeah, we're, we're not protecting the ball on third down. We're, we're, uh, we're three for 11. And they just have these numbers off the top of their head. And he's just like, but we got each other guys. And it's, it's absolutely crazy that it, it reminds me of Matt Nagy and where the whys and all that kind of stuff. Um, just it's what coaches say when they have nothing schematic to provide or nothing that's statistical to provide. They start getting into your emotions and start talking about that nonsense. Um, two things that you were saying, Nick, like in the middle of that, like uh, Paulie mentioned this to me earlier as well. Justin Fields probably would be better on this team right now than Caleb Williams, just purely off the athletic ability and what kind of line that they're providing. Um, I'm not a big fan of Justin Fields over Caleb Williams at all, at all. And it's been consistent. We think that Caleb Williams is the future and he's that good. But right now, the way that they're running this team, yeah, probably Justin Fields would be a better fit for this team than what you're seeing out of Caleb Williams and what they're doing for him to help him scheme him up and get players open and get your tight end involved and have Keenan Allen stop running 15 yard out routes and stuff like that. Cause that's just never been his game and it's just not his game now. And I, I don't understand it. Um, and then yeah, secondly, the, the issue with fields also fell a little bit more on the contractual timeline. Like you'd have to pay him at some point. And, and I think that was oh, no, part we, of it. But if you just hone in on the one game, like if you just yeah, go, yeah. you know, one game. Yeah. I think fields is way more used to avoiding that kind of pressure. And you saw Caleb Williams running out there like a chicken with his head cut off. Yeah. Can I, can I comment real quick on the Justin Fields contract situation? Mm -hmm. I think that, we could have picked up his fifth year option, which would only been, you know, 14, I think it was 14.5 million, something like that. It was in that range. It was under, no, it was 16.5. I'm sorry. I would have rather have paid him. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy with Caleb Williams. He is the future. We've seen those flashes. It's just that you need an offensive line for your quarterback. And we went out and did nothing with that. Nate Davis, obviously a giant bust. Coleman Shelton was good four years ago. It pretty much you were better off keeping Cody Whitehair at that point, minus the contract situation, obviously. But Coleman Shelton, he's just, he's the worst. He's the worst center possible that we could have gotten. And also, where's Ryan Bates at this point? It's, he has arthritis, Nick. Leave he, him alone. He's an old man. <laughs> hey, let's, all right, Ryan Bates does? Oh, you didn't know that? That's, um, when this is the big criticism for me. Ryan Poles, uh, his shoulder and elbow issues are arthritic based meaning that they've been going on for a long time. And Ryan Poles Ryan knew Bates, that in his yeah. Ryan Bates knew that. So Ryan, no, Ryan Poles knew that. And Ryan Bates is issues knew the are, injury are arthritic. Yeah. So he knew off of the medical staff and he still went out and just traded draft capital for him. Um, isn't but it, you know, is, isn't it amazing though, that we said no to Larry Ogunjobi, who's doing very well in Pittsburgh now because of his injury status. And ever since then, Poles has just brought in these injury riddle guys, Karan Amagaji, Ryan Bates now, uh, yeah. also just, just come on, man. <laughs> there was like five or six pro bowl centers switching teams in the off season this year. And we just picked up none of them and we traded oh. draft capital for Ryan Bates instead. Also, you know, I was a big, um, big proponent of trade back in the draft, pick up a little bit more draft capital, probably go defensive end and get yourself a center in round two with that draft capital that you pick up. But you could so have Jackson powers. Johnson went 44th so for overall. me. It's like that Roma Dunze pick as much as I want to like Roman, as much as I understand that that's a pick for the future. It just still seemed like, wait a second, wide receiver three here. Like this isn't going to impact the football games this year as much as other moves could have that you could have made. And, um, yeah, I, I really didn't like it. And, I, you know, not to say that I don't like Rome. I do like Rome, but um, I just feel just from a team building standpoint, they could have done things differently to be able to address obvious holes. And I know there's this whole um, 
whole talk about, well, you take the best player available at a certain point. Sure. But I mean, when you have so many obvious holes, I think you need to get those fixed first and that could benefit you a lot more. So I just thought that the draft was mishandled at the end of the day, we have two offensive picks in the top 10. So like you expect to lean on an offense at some point, it's not happening. It's just not. Yeah. Uh, and then real quick before we, I, I do have two really great, I think good topic moving questions for Nick. Here's, I, I almost want to retitle this episode as the stench of McCaskey interference is returning. And, uh, and I, me and Polly had get to get into arguments about this maybe three to four times a year, Nick. And, um, I'm a big believer of ownership is top down. It is the thing that makes teams good or bad long term. Overall, um, Washington got rid of them. If you're, you know, you're a Cubs fan, or I don't know if you're a Sox or Cubs fan, but like when the um, Ricketts got a hold of the team and everything, whatever. I think the McCaskies, until they are gone or until they choose to sell, I think there's going to be similar, if not lingering, issues like this. It's very rare that this type of pathetic ownership. Um, ends up working and here's my experiment for you and just in terms of thought experiment you're talking about we you know Iberflus is a first year guy and we rarely do this stuff but the pattern and I said this to Polly as soon as Matt Iberflus got hired as soon as he got hired I said you know what he's gonna get fired in three to four years and you know what we're gonna do we're gonna get an offensive whiz kid genius because if you just look at the pattern George McCaskey is such a simpleton he is such a moron that he just goes like, well, we have Lovey and he's consistent, but he's boring. And so now I want to be like the hot offensive thing. So I'm going to get the hottest offensive guy from Canada and I'm going to get Mark Trestman. Oh, Mark Trestman made me look like a fool. So I'm going to get somebody consistent like Lovey, because at least with Lovey, we were consistent. And you go back to John Fox and add John Fox is too boring. And he's too paint by numbers and blah, blah, blah. And so you go to Matt Nagy, who's coaching. Patrick Mahomes and he's the hottest new thing and now Matt Nagy would blew up in my face so I want to redo the lovey thing again so I'm going to get a disciple of lovey and go with Matt Eberflus and I guarantee you we are going to hire either Ben Johnson if we are willing to pay the money which I don't believe because McCaskies will never shell out that type of money and or we're going to get like Lincoln Riley or we're going to get some fucking moron hot shot offensive coordinator who goes into the meeting room with George and George is just like, this guy makes me feel real smart. I'm going to hire this guy. And that's what you're going to see as the next step of this. And it's going to be just, just another year recycle, rinse, repeat. Yeah. Pattern's I, been there for years. I agree. I mean, I, I was very, I was excited about John Fox at first. And then I was like, wow, we have a bad roster and a, a good, this is when you see if a good coach is a good coach. He just didn't get it done. George McCaskey. I have select words from him because obviously I would like to work for the bears one day. And it doesn't seem like that guy's letting go of the team at any point. So I have to watch kind of what I say about him. Definitely. I will say, I will say this though, is that George McCaskey hiring a consultant and you hire your head coach before or your general manager the same day as the head coach and your general manager doesn't get to choose the head coach. That was a bit of a red flag and polls. If you listen to how he talks, about Eberflus. Eberflus is my guy. We trust him. This is that he doesn't go into detail about him. And sure, Flus is a great, great defensive minded guy, but you can't have someone like that. And if you're an owner and you're hiring a consultant to choose your team for you, when you're the one that's worth billions of dollars, where you are paying the paychecks, hundred million dollar payrolls, but you're making a billion dollars a year off that because the fans keep showing up because you know, you have a loyal fan base it's a definition of insanity. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again and it's not going to work, that's pure insanity. I think George McCaskey needs to, I mean, he has generational wealth for the next 15 generations, probably forever. Let's just say that. And I think that George McCaskey does need to let go of this team. I think he still does put his hand where it's not asked. And if it was Ryan Pohl's decision coming from Kansas City and learning what it's like to have a winning culture, Flus would have been canned last year. He did go on a hot streak at the end of the year. We almost made the playoffs. Great. Almost. Only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Doesn't matter anymore. George McCaskey needs to let go of this team. He needs to stop. Give it to a group that actually wants to win. I like that you brought up the Ricketts because I feel like the Ricketts got their win and they did what the McCaskies did. 
And, and now they're like, oh, well, Cub fans are just going to show up no matter what every single time because look what happened with the team this year. I want, I want George McCaskey to get rid of this team because when I met him at training camp, really nice guy. With nice guys don't always win football games. I want an owner to come in, clear house, know that this is a good roster. As an owner, sit down with the players and be like, what are you guys looking for? And build this thing correctly. And I'm not saying get rid of Ryan Poles. I think Ryan Poles has done a great job minus the offensive line, which is kind of crazy considering he was an offensive lineman. He's got one more draft in him, kind of like Ryan Pace. And if he gets the next draft right, having four picks in the first three rounds and goes very heavy on offensive linemen, I think he saves this thing. But the, George McCaskey's got to go. He's the main problem. He's the he's the toxic person in this entire situation because it all starts at the top. And I believe once Virginia finally passes, which you know isn't anytime soon, it looks like she just keeps going and going and going. It's not going to change, unfortunately. But I do think new leadership needs to come in. See, and, and I mean, we've argued this back and forth, and I hate trying to defend the McCaskies in any way because they're not, they haven't earned it. They're not worth defending. But I do look at other organizations around the league. You know, Jim Mersey is not a good owner, but it's not, a, but when they had Peyton Manning, Bill Pullian was just fine. You know what I mean? And um, there's, we could go on and on about examples. And David gives me examples of the other way where, you know, once ownership does change, things change around. I just, I truly, I always try and focus GM down. And to me, it's, you know, it, it's sad because it only comes down to a few plays and a few things that need to be different, but those are the things that can change with a better head coach. You know, those decisions during a game can win you a couple games and whatnot. And when things are going good, I don't see anybody praising McCaskey or praising Virginia or anything like that. And and the fact of the matter is there are worse franchises out there that have had less success. I mean, we were in a Super Bowl in 2006. We were in an NFC championship in 2010. We you did make a little playoff run in 2018. It's not saying much. It really isn't. However, I'm just saying that when those moments arise, I don't hear the praise for the ownership. And so to me, I just cut that out of the picture. I tend to focus more of GM and head coach down. And I think as long as you get the head coach and the quarterback, right. Those two things, I think you could definitely have success despite ownership. And so, I mean, it's an, unfortunately an uphill battle, but I think it's not going to change her anytime soon. So that's what we're going to have to do. Me and Polly could do a whole hour episode about this literal debate. But I think, I think when you say it's GM down and it's coach down, I I don't think you hire the right GM or the right coach if your mentality isn't correct. And at this point, you go watch go watch the opening of Hard Knocks, just from this year. It's it's a two minute intro about forty years ago, and they they just can't get it out of their head that this is some sort of. Uh, legendary charter franchise with a rivalry to Green Bay. You you've lost the last ten straight games to Green Bay. This isn't a rivalry anymore. This is you are the bitch of the NFC North. And I'm sorry, like, and there's a few comments in here that we're not posting, but people saying like polls is polls endorsed Eberflus and this and that. I'm I can't prove it. I'll never be able to prove it, and I'm not gonna ask Nick to comment on it because if he's being a little bit more yeah, careful with his we're words. limited. No, no, like, no, 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 guys, guys, I, I'm happy to comment on anything. But just, it's just, just it's, put that out there. <laughs> if, if you, first of all, it's just a known fact that Eberflus was hired before polls. It is a fact. It is not up for debate. It is a, it is cold, hard fact that Eberflus was hired. Then they hired polls like two or three days later. Then they reconfirmed with polls. And I'm sorry, go to a job interview for your dream job and say like, so we already hired your coach. What do you think about that, Ryan? Do you say no? What the fuck's the guy's going to say? Of course, he's going to say, like, no, great choice, George. It's it's the best choice that you could have ever seen. It's, it's amazing. And then, yes, he doubled down last year. So I will give people that argument. But even then, the McCaskies have never fired a head coach in the middle of the season ever. And it's not because of some honor system that they have. It's not because they're just the most – amazing sweet generous people and they've always want to give people a choice it, at the it's because they don't want to pay coaches that are not doing their job it is a notorious fact of the mccaskies 
David, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know we are limited on time. Nick, if you just want to give us your response, yeah. and I kind of want to just move on to the game itself. No, no, no. I, I want to comment on this because it's Crimson, you dig, is saying it. Dennis Moody is saying it. I'm looking at the chat right now. And yeah. the Bears did this entire thing half-ass backwards. They did. Yeah. They hired their head coach first, then their GM, then their CEO. They should have hired their CEO because he would have had more say in the situation. Then you hire your GM because then he's going to be working well with Kevin Warren or whoever the CEO would have been. And then you hire your head coach. Cause I guarantee you that he would, that polls would have brought someone in from Kansas city, or he would have gone in a completely different direction versus uh, Matt Eberflus. And I wish that the bear and you know what polls and Eberflus did ha have the same agent. They have connections it doesn't mean that they're the same person on the same page because they coach two completely different teams. Look at the Chiefs. They built that offense for Patrick Mahomes. They built the line first. Then they brought in Mahomes. And sure, then you had a target in Tyreek Hill. You win three Super Bowls that way because now he has longevity and then they have a defense. I think that the Bears made the biggest mistake. Sure, you can, I, Dave, I'm agreeing with you. You know, the McCaskies would be the McCaskies. That's fine, but they should have hired a CEO first. That's That's my... Last comment on the subject. I know that, Paul, you want to move on to the game, but yeah, I, do. I think we should have done CEO first.